The Cellar. Today's story takes us to Disneyland. Disneyland is a breathtaking theme park located within Anaheim, California. It was the first theme park opened by the Walt Disney Company, and it was the only park ever designed and constructed under the direct supervision of the late, great Walt Disney himself. Walt Disney would purchase a 160-acre plot of land in Anaheim, and he began work on the park in 1954. The park would open to the public on July 17th of 1955. Disneyland has been entertaining those around the world for 70 years now, and the park has a larger cumulative attendance than any other theme park throughout the entire world. It's said that the park has been visited over 757 million times since its inception, with close to 17 million visits occurring in 2022 alone. Over the years, the park has undergone numerous renovations and expansions. Additions like New Orleans Square in 1966, Bear Country in 1972, Mickey's Toontown in 1993, and Star Wars Galaxy Edge in 2019. Now, I recently covered a heartbreaking story that transpired at Disneyland in July of 1974. 18-year-old Deborah Gale Stone was a new employee at the park and she was crushed while working at the America Sings attraction. Her story is tragic to say the least, but she is not the only person to suffer a grisly end to their life while within the gates of a Disney park. Numerous incidents have occurred since the park's inception and today's story will take us to one ride in particular. That ride being Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin. Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin opened in Disneyland on January 26, 1994. The ride was based on the Steven Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis award-winning film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which was released in theaters on June 22, 1988. The Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin ride is considered a dark ride. For those that don't know what a dark ride is, a dark ride is an indoor amusement ride on which passengers board guided vehicles. These guided vehicles then travel through specially lit scenes that typically contain animation, sound, music, and special effects. The intention of dark rides is to tell stories with thematic elements that immerse riders in the overall experience. Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin was located within the Mickey's Toontown section of the park. Since its inception in 1994, the ride had been an absolute hit amongst all the children visiting Disneyland. That was no different for four-year-old Brandon Zucker. Brandon and his family were from Canyon Country, northern Los Angeles. Brandon was visiting the park in September of 2000 with his family. They had arrived at around 11 a.m. and had enjoyed a long and exciting day at the park. As the day started to wind down, Brandon had his eyes set on one last ride. The four-year-old, like many other kids his age, loved everything about Mickey's Toontown. In particular, the Roger Rabbit's Cartoon Spin ride. Brandon made his want to go on the ride very clear, and soon he and his mother were boarding the zigzagging taxi car. The ride was designed to seat two people per taxi. The taxi cab would then wait for the traffic light to turn green before exiting the loading area and beginning the adventure through Toontown. The whole idea of the ride was that you were being taken on a tour of Toontown while the cab spun around at a full 360 degrees. Now, I have seen some different reporting on exactly how everyone was seated for this ride, but from what I have gathered, Brandon was seated near the opening at the passenger side door. His six-year-old brother was also in the cab, while Brandon's mother sat behind the wheel of the taxi. Brandon's father and grandmother boarded the taxi cab just behind Brandon, following along on the adventure. The traffic light would soon turn green, and the ride was in motion, the same as it had done so many times before. But at the time, the family had no idea what horrors soon awaited them. A few minutes into the ride, 
Brandon's mother bent down to pick something up. Now, I have seen this reported a few ways, with one source stating that Brandon had dropped something out of the car. But nonetheless, within a blink of an eye, Brandon Zucker had fallen out of the taxicab car. Brandon's father witnessed the event from behind and stated that Brandon didn't even have enough time to scream. It happened so fast. Brandon's father would start yelling for help, yelling that his son had fallen out of the car and was now stuck underneath it. Brandon's father soon took action, jumping out of the moving cab and doing everything in his power to stop the car that was now dragging his son underneath it. The cab would continue its route for another 10 feet before finally coming to a stop within the Bull in a China Shop section of the ride. Brandon's father would desperately try to lift the car off of his son, but the car simply wouldn't budge an inch. The attendant for the ride quickly realized that something was wrong and swiftly stopped the ride. Brandon's father ran to the attendant and told him what had occurred, begging him for help. The emergency shutoff would be hit and the ride was quickly evacuated. From here, I have heard differing reports on how helpful Disney workers actually were in helping Brandon, with some reports stating that the Disney employees simply stood back while guests at the park would eventually rush to the aid of the child. Upwards of 10 guests made an effort to lift the cab car off of Brandon, but their efforts were in vain as the cab would not budge whatsoever. Eventually, a call was made to the local police department but many have stated that it took Disney officials far too long to make this call. Police would rush to the scene within minutes, with firefighters following right behind them. The fire department was able to use a jack on the cab car. This jack would finally move the car enough to get Brandon out from underneath it. But at this point, Brandon was completely blue in color. Staff at the park would begin CPR, and soon paramedics would take over and miraculously, they managed to get a pulse. From there, Brandon would soon be rushed to the UCI Medical Center, where he would immediately be rushed into surgery. The surgery would last hours as Brandon had suffered a ruptured diaphragm, a collapsed left lung, a torn liver and spleen, and a fractured pelvis. He would ultimately survive, but he spent numerous weeks in a coma. His numerous internal injuries and the severe lack of oxygen to the brain had caused irreversible brain damage. Following the tragic accident, an investigation into what transpired would take place. In December of 2000, a state agency in charge of investigating the accident concluded that a likely cause was a lap bar that had malfunctioned along with Brandon's placement next to an opening in the car. Brandon was the smallest rider and according to policy, he should have been furthest from the cutout doorway, not the one placed right next to it as he had been. Following the tragedy, numerous safety adjustments were made to the ride, with the most notable being that of a sensor that would guard around the bottom of each car. The Zucker family would end up suing Disney. Brandon had survived the ordeal, but his condition would require lifelong medical treatment. Around 17 months after that fateful day, the Zucker family would end up settling with Disney out of court for an undisclosed amount. No details about the settlement have ever been released, but the understanding was that Brandon's medical care would be covered for the rest of his life. Over the next eight years, Brandon's family would do everything they could for him. He endured numerous surgeries, and the family participated in a ton of different therapies to try and help the young boy. But at the end of the day, Brandon never fully recovered from his injuries. His family would later state that after eight years, he simply grew tired. That brings us to a Sunday morning in 2009, when Brandon Zucker was found unresponsive within his home. He was rushed to the Children's Hospital of Orange County, and eventually passed away the following day at only 13 years old. In the eight years since his accident, Brandon's family had done all they could to give the young boy the best quality of life possible. I have covered a lot of different stories on the channel, and most of the ones that occur at amusement parks have ended in a swift manner. But Brandon's story may be the most tragic, as his accident left him in a constant struggle for many, many years. For me, it's stories like this that are absolutely heartbreaking. I wish stories like Brandon's didn't have to happen in order for safety to be treated as a higher priority within amusement parks. Brandon's fate could have been avoided if more precautions were taken, 
Hell, his story could have been prevented altogether if he had just been placed correctly within the taxi cab car. I hope in sharing Brandon's story, we can shine a brighter light on safety within amusement parks in general, as profits should never outweigh the safety of so many lives that visit amusement parks throughout the world. My deepest condolences go out to Brandon Zucker and all of his family and friends. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. If you enjoy the content, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, if you want to make sure you never miss a new upload, you can turn on that bell notification after you've subscribed. In the description box below, you will also find a link to my merch store and a link to the Seller Dwellers membership tier for the channel. If you're interested, please take a moment to check those things out. The Seller Dwellers membership is only $2.99 a month and comes with some pretty cool perks. If you'd like to submit your own scary story or a story recommendation in general, you can do so using the email that I have linked in the description box below. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself, so anything that you do to support this channel is greatly appreciated. Until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into the cellar.